Welcome to Chatham Elam Church. We're going to start things off with some worship. Louder 
Your praise, our hearts will cry. 
Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to church. It is fantastic to have you join us today, whether you are regular or whether this is your first time. You are most welcome. And uh, we do encourage you to subscribe to this YouTube channel um, and uh, take a glance and uh, indulge in everything else that's available to you on this channel. We are getting very good at getting stuff online these days. And um, but it's part of our way of adapting to this new way of, of doing some things. And uh, I guess every single time I, I come here to deliver a message like this, um, I find it more odd each time I do it. So this week I've tried to normalize a couple of things um, and I'm gonna do so by personalizing um, one or two things right now. So in the last week or so, uh, it was Sheila's 90th birthday. So happy birthday, Sheila. I don't even know if you're watching this right now, but whether you are or not, you have got a shout out on YouTube this morning. And I thought in your honor, Sheila, I would put your face on one of my office chairs. So this morning, I'm gonna be preaching just to you in the hope that one day you will get saved. Sheila, I think, is already saved, so hopefully this one will go quite well in that respect. We are struggling in some ways with this season. There are many of us that are trying to work out how we can still live life, what we can do, what we can't do. And some of us are, are kind of in that position where we're really, really struggling to um, to, to live a, a normal life. And, and obviously me having issues with who I'm preaching to or the lack of people in this office that I'm preaching to right now um, is, is kind of like tip of the iceberg, really. They are, they are privileged problems to be having. And I say that not disrespectfully at all to anyone who's struggling in any kind of way. Mental health issues are very real right now. There are some issues that are going on behind closed doors where people would normally get, be able to get help for those kinds of things. They're not able to access the same kind of help. We're not trying to diminish any of those issues that are genuinely present right now for many people. But there are some things for some of us that we are struggling with, but we would class them as privileged problems to be having. For example, there was this thing on Twitter this week, I wanna read it out to us for us to be able to, to digest together. Um, and it was something shared by uh, the news anchor, Jon Snow on Twitter. And it says this, a view from an Indian doctor. Social distancing is a privilege. It means you live in a house large enough to practice it. Hand washing is a privilege too. It means you have access to running water. Hand sanitizers are a privilege. It means you have money to buy them. Lockdowns are a privilege. It means you can afford to be at home. Most of the ways towards the corona off are accessible only to the affluent. In essence, a disease that was spread by the rich as they flew around the globe will now kill, kill millions of the poor. All of us who are practicing social distancing and have imposed the lockdown on ourselves must appreciate how privileged we are. Many Indians won't be able to do any of this. Sobering thought to begin with, but I wanted to piggyback off that thought in some ways and say, we may not feel like we are privileged to have choice, but we do. See, so we're going to read a, a bit of scripture together, but the context for this scripture is essentially that Paul is speaking to some Romans, and that's why it's called the Book of Romans, helpfully enough. And the context that Paul is speaking into is that the nation of Israel, the Jewish population, have chosen to reject God to the point where they actually crucified his son. And Paul's opened up this idea that as a nation, you can reject God. And so your whole nation will feel the consequence of rejecting or distancing themselves from said God. But Paul wants to open up this idea that actually God has a plan to bring everyone back together again, but it comes from a very unexpected group. It comes from an, an outside source. It comes from an unindoctrinated population. And so he's opening this up 
this this train of thought up that that some that, that what we call the Gentiles, the people who weren't Jewish, the people who weren't part of the the nation of Israel at the time, um, these people would actually be part of God's plan in bringing everyone back together again. So let's read a couple of verses together. It says this in Romans chapter eleven, verse eleven. It says this again. I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? Paul's basically saying, um, has anyone been cast away to the point where they can't return? Absolutely not. That's not the point of this. When someone rejects God, can they, do they stay rejected? Do they stay in this place of, of being outside or, or distant from God himself? And they say, no, that's not the point. He's just saying, actually, God can still use this time of people rejecting him to connect with another group of people to the point where actually connecting with another group of people will actually help the original group of people actually be reconciled and everyone actually comes back together to the point where greater riches behold full inclusion. So this is really interesting for us because naturally in this current phase of life we're kind of wondering what does connection with God actually look like? What does it mean? to live reconciled to God? What does it mean to have a consequence where distancing and isolation is a, is a major factor of all of our beings? Now, I'm going to say a quote right now. It's going to be a little bit hard to hear, but bear with me as I say this. Um, parachurch organizations, for those of us that don't know, parachurch organizations are, are members of the Christian community that wouldn't call themselves the church, they would call themselves connected to the church. They are organizations like Gloucestershire uh, Youth for Christ here. They are organizations like Care for the Family. They are um, uh, they're, they're, they're missional organizations that wouldn't call themselves the church. They're doing a different job than what the church is wanting to do, but they would call themselves Christian in their ethos, in their practice, and in their mission. But essentially, this quote says this, these parachurch organizations stepped in because the church chose to stop doing certain things, things like mission, for example. But the quote goes on to say this, the church stepped in because disciples, followers of Jesus Christ, chose to stop doing certain things. For some of us, we come to church to worship God because we stopped worshiping God in our own homes, in our own ways. Some of us come to church to pray because we don't know how to pray in our own homes. Some of us come to church in order to fellowship with other Christians because we don't know how to do that outside of the four walls of church. I'm not saying this so that we feel bad. I'm saying that in this season, in the same way that God was opening up a season where he wanted to reconcile some people back to their original source, I believe in this season we've got an opportunity to rediscover the proper order of our priorities as individual followers of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 11 leads to Romans chapter 12. Wow. But it says this, Romans chapter 12, one of my favorite verses in all of scripture, it says this, Offer all of yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We as followers get to be worshipers of Jesus first. The church and the mission are empowered by the people living in love with Jesus Christ, not the other way around. It's great that we've got parachurch missional organizations, but they should be fueled by disciples who are already in love with Jesus Christ. It's great that we've got churches. It's great that we're still able to meet and gather as church right now in this season, but the church is best served when it's empowered by people who are already in love with Jesus. The problem that we've had and what we've seen is that we've maybe done this the wrong way around. We've allowed missional organizations and churches to empower the disciple. But essentially what God's ideal is, is that we stay so close to our source, so close to our, our the, the love of our lives, that 
It is he who empowers us to then go and empower the church and missional organizations and communities and neighborhoods and other lives as best as we can. I will say that some people who may be slightly less mature in their faith want to separate these things out from each other and, and only d allow themselves to entertain one at a time. But a true disciple of Jesus Christ, a true worshipper of who he is, allows their lives to not to be a worship to the point where um, love and fellowship for your fellow person and mission and compassion and grace is extended to every other person and all of that happens all at the same time not separate from another not disjointed from one another not segregated from one another but acting in in unison empowering one another as it goes romans chapter 11 goes on to say this if their transgression, um, read that from verse 12, from verse 13 says this, I am talking to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry. Now that is the, um, the version that I've got here in this Bible, which is the NIV version. In the English Standard Version, it says, instead of, instead of the phrase, I take pride in my ministry, in the English Standard Version, it says, I magnify my ministry. And I thought that was a really interesting concept, really interesting sentence to bring out to the, to the front. You see, I believe we've all been given a ministry, a calling, a person or a something to consider beyond ourselves. This is why I don't think we can separate out our individual walks with God, with our fellowship with other Christians, with our mission to non-believers. We can't keep them segregated because if I'm called by Jesus Christ to be part of his family, I am also therefore called to take part in his mission. They are one in the same journey that we take with everyone else. And it means that if I am then truly walking in my sense of being called as a son of God the Father himself. It means that I have a ministry placed on my life from him, something that only I can do. It could be a characteristic. For those of us who are part of this church, we may know a fella called Pete Very. And Pete Very is um, someone who you spend two minutes talking to him. You know exactly what he cares about. He cares about people who don't know Jesus. And someone else could have a characteristic in our community today that's very much like that. For some reason, you just, you can't get your head out of that. And and uh, some people would, would call that um, a little bit annoying just to be banging on about the same thing over and over and over again. Some other people would call it inspiring. I am one of those people. And... Um, so it could be a characteristic that you're called to. It could be a people group that you're called to. It's obvious who Sam Olele is called to. He loves young people. Um, he wants them to know Jesus. He wants them to connect with him. It doesn't matter if they're Christian, doesn't matter if they're non-Christian. He just knows that he's got calling on his life to translate the good news so that young people can understand it. It could be a characteristic, it could be a people group, it could be a gifting. Bean Baker has been working tremendously. He's worked wonders to bring creativity and media into effect for us. And what a gift that has been to our church in this current season. You may not know how or why or when it was birthed, but you can't seem to get away from it. Such will be the emphasis that would be on your life about this certain thing. You may have more than one thing that you like to entertain at any given point in time, but there could be one characteristic within that. There could be one gifting within all that. There could be one people group within all of that that for some reason you just can't seem to get away from. It becomes your pivot point. It becomes your, 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 your navigational system. It becomes the, the, the lens from which you see almost everything through. But what's interesting is that we must be bold enough to speak out these callings that are upon our lives, to magnify them. We must be, we must be allowing ourselves to consider them an honor to uphold. You see, this is what's so interesting about it. Only you get to pour out what God has placed in you. And God has placed something in you. He placed it there from birth. 
he knitted you together. He, he allowed you to be birthed in the environment that you were birthed in with all the factors that were going on with that, that would, that would nurture some of these things that are inside of us. And what's beautiful about all of this is that if God has placed something in it, he deter determines that it is worthy to be released upon the world that exists around you. It's not something that it was an afterthought. It was something that was, that was part and parcel of the knitting you together in your mother's room. <clears throat> Which means that it is of highest honour that we get to live out these callings that are placed upon our lives. These giftings that we could carry, these characteristics that we hold... But the best way that we can honor that which God has poured into our lives is by allowing someone else, anyone else, to benefit from it. It is our way of channeling the very spirit of Jesus Christ into the world that exists around us. And this spirit is the spirit of reconciliation. And this is the spirit that is laden all the way through this passage of scripture that we're talking about. Christ's desire through Paul's writings reveals to us that what he wants is, is, the, is the Jewish population to come back to Jesus, to be reconciled to him all over again. He wants the Gentiles, the people who weren't part of this story originally, he wants them to be reconciled in. He wants both of those two groups to be reconciled to each other so that as a whole, they get to reflect um, exactly who Jesus Christ really is. This is what it goes on to say. We'll skip a couple of verses. It says this in verse 17. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive roots, do not consider yourself to be superior to the other branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Reconciliation dictates that those who are wandering or are broken off will still be recognized as coming from the same roots and have the same opportunity to return to the roots. Even if we are wandering on different paths, even when we're in isolated places right now, the beautiful thing about all this is that we have the same root which is supplying for every single one of us. God's desire is to see and to host reconciliation. All of us back to himself all those people that are wandering back to himself and all of us together back together under who he is. Let's skip ahead another couple of verses. It says this in verse 23 and 24. If they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out, if you, if you, were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? God's desire from the very start was so that the Jewish people would be able to come back to him. God's desire from the very dawn of mankind was so that every single person could find a way back to him. His whole reconciliation mission by sending Jesus Christ was so that anyone, anywhere, anytime could be reconciled back to him. And we have a choice to put our hands up and contribute to the reconciliation message of hope that we can invite everyone else into. We have the capacity to extend the hands of grace in such a way right now so that anyone else, everyone else, could receive something of the reconciliation and hope that's in Jesus Christ through his grace and through our testimony and witness. So a couple of questions for us as we bring this to a conclusion. What is your main posture before God? Are you a worshipper? Or have you been guilty of maybe consuming? Taking and taking and taking everything from God, asking him to step in over and over again without ever actually offering yourselves in worship before him. Second question, who is in fact in your sphere of influence? There are many people who exist around us who would only be able to understand this message through the way that we uniquely can communicate this to them. And that could be through our characteristic, through our calling, through our gifting. But who is in that, those spheres? 
And what are we doing today that can help them live restored to the root of who Jesus Christ actually is? So those questions I leave with you. These thoughts are yours to do what you like with. After this, we're going to say a few prayers together and we're going to conclude our time together. But thank you so much for taking part in this one. And can I just encourage you from the bottom of my heart to yours, I thank God that we are all in this together, that we are part of the same family, the same tree. I thank God that he's birthed some things inside of every single one of us that are so unique to us. And I thank God that those unique qualities, giftings and callings are things that can genuinely help translate this message of reconciliation, this message of hope to a whole bunch of people. So can I encourage you to live proud of the ministry that God has called you into today? Can I encourage you to send messages? Can I encourage you to extend the hand of grace? Can I encourage you to translate this in a way that someone else will be able to not just hear it, but receive it for themselves? Can I encourage you to be fully you, alive, awaken, before God and alongside everybody else? How you do that in this season of isolation, use technology, allow it to be your friend. But any way and every way you possibly can, let's live those lives as worshippers before Jesus Christ, reconciled to him first, and then let's use everything that he's given to us to live reconciled to everybody else. That's our choice that we get to partake in today. And that is what we will choose to do. God bless you all. Church, let's stand and pray together if you are able. Almighty God, we thank you that you are the God of everything, that you are mighty and powerful beyond our expectations and beyond anything we can think or ask. You are God and we are not, and that is a great truth to know today. Father, as we stand here in your presence, we ask that you would be with us, that you would give us strength and courage to stand at this time, that you would lead us to inherit this town, to bring about your banner for glory over Cheltenham, that you would lead us and be with us and not forsake us that you will give us the strength and courage we need every single day. Lord, help us to meditate on your word and to bathe in your presence and to be all that you have called us to be at this time. Be salt and light to those around us. To be a beacon of peace, a beacon of hope, a beacon of your love and grace in these times. Help us to be prosperous and successful at this time. Help us to Show people what it is to be a follower of Jesus. Lord, would you increase in us, we pray. Give us the wisdom and the words to bless those around us. Help us to love and be strong. And help us to be bold with our words, bold in our love, bold in our grace, and the way that we stride out in our faith for your name and for your glory. So Lord, bless us and keep us. Make your face shine upon us. Give us your peace. And above all, be everything that we need today. For your glory. Amen. We're going to give you some space now to transition back into the rest of your day. Um, We'd love you to take some time. And also as part of our worship, we are giving some details on how you can give both online or via text. Um, It's all a part of our worship. Have a great day.